Hi everyone, I found myself in need of some copper sulfate for an upcoming project, and while it's really easy to find online and relatively cheap, I decided to synthesize it on my own, just because it's always way more fun that way. And there are a lot of videos already showing this process, and they're really great, I highly recommend watching those. Um, but I modified the process a little bit, and I thought it was quite interesting, and it's also a really fun synthesis, so I decided it was worth it to make a video of my own, and I hope you enjoy watching. I chose to synthesize the copper sulfate through the electrolysis process. Here's the overall chemical equation, and I'll use electricity to oxidize copper metal, which will then combine with sulfate ions in a sulfuric acid solution, producing copper sulfate. The electrolyte I'm using is 6 molar sulfuric acid. This is the same solution used to fill dry charged batteries and can be sourced from most auto parts stores in the U.S. Nerd Rage made a great video of this process and recommended setting up the cathode well above the anode, and we'll start with the same setup. There's a link to his video in the description if you're interested in watching that as well. As far as the electrode materials go, the anode has to be copper. As the anode will be consumed in the reaction, its surface area should also be large to provide an excess of copper ions in order to increase our yield of product. I chose to use some old quarter inch copper tubing I had sitting around the house. I coiled it up at the bottom to increase surface area at the bottom of the beaker. I insulated the copper with silicone tubing from the power supply to the bottom of the electrode, and this was done to protect this portion of the anode from corrosion. If left unprotected, it would likely fall apart before the rest of its surface area is able to react with the acid. The cathode can be any inert material such as platinum or carbon, or we can simply go with copper again as its reaction product with sulfuric acid is copper sulfate, exactly what we're looking for anyway. I chose to use some six gauge copper grounding wire I also had laying around the shop. I just bent it into a clip-like shape so it'll stay put on the beaker. To get an idea of why the electrodes are set up this way, we have to understand how this process works. On the top left, we have our cathode and the bottom we have our anode. The electrons will want to travel from the cathode to the anode, and the electrolyte will conduct the electricity, but how does this actually happen? To answer this, we'll need to take into account what can react within the system. The electrolyte contains water and sulfuric acid, and when combined, these substances form reactive cations and anions. Due to the autoionization of water, there is a small amount of hydronium and hydroxide ions. Sulfuric acid dissociates in water forming two hydronium ions and a sulfate ion. The hydronium ion can just be thought of as a hydrogen ion for simplicity here. And because these ions are mobile in water, they act as charge carriers when a potential difference is applied to the electrodes. When we turn up the voltage, the electrons in the copper will become more concentrated at the cathode, forming a net negative charge. Electrons will migrate away from the anode, so there will be a net positive charge here due to the positively charged protons in the copper metal, which remain immobile. Our mobile ions in solution will begin to migrate to their oppositely charged electrode, positive to negative, and negative to positive, so the electrode surface is where our reaction occurs. At the anode, the positively charged electrode wants to steal electrons. Electrons could be stripped away from the sulfate ion, the hydroxide ion, or the copper atoms within the electrode. The ions in solution are more stable than the copper, so the copper metal is oxidized. Two electrons are stripped away, and the copper atom is ionized, and it will now dissolve into the solution. While in solution, the polar water molecules will prevent the copper and sulfate ions from bonding, but when we want to collect our copper sulfate, we'll have to remove most of the water molecules by boiling down the solution. The ions will remain in the solution and will now be able to interact, forming an ionic compound, and will crystallize out as our desired product, copper sulfate. In terms of the lonely hydroxide ion hanging out over there, in reality, there's only a negligible amount of hydroxide ions to react in the solution. The amount of water that auto-ionizes is very small, and this is a highly acidic solution with the ratio favoring the hydronium ions. But if any tiny amount of copper hydroxide is produced from trace hydroxide ions, it'll just convert to more copper sulfate due to the presence of the sulfuric acid. At the cathode, the negatively charged electrode wants to donate electrons. 
the positively charged ions are attracted to the electrode. The reaction favors the reduction of the copper ion back to solid copper metal. This is an unfavorable outcome because we want as much copper in solution as possible to increase our yield of copper sulfate. In order to increase the yield, we can arrange the apparatus to make it more difficult for the copper ions to reach the cathode. That's why the cathode is above the anode. As copper ions are produced at the anode, they tend to congregate at the bottom of the beaker so long as the solution isn't agitated. By keeping the cathode as far above the anode as possible, we prevent it from reducing the copper ions. Therefore, the charge carrier becomes the hydrogen ions, which are reduced to form hydrogen gas, which then exits the system. Let's go ahead and crank up the voltage and see what kind of current we get. Looks like right now if we provide 2 volts, we level out at about 1.74 amps. The bubbles at the electrodes give us a good idea of what's going on. Here we see a good production of hydrogen gas forming at the cathode. This means the reaction is favoring the reduction of hydrogen ions to hydrogen gas, adding copper sulfate to the solution. We don't want to see oxygen bubbles forming on the anode, as this means we're hydrolyzing the water in solution in addition to oxidizing copper. That's not a huge deal, but it's not very efficient, and it doesn't benefit our yield at all. This occurs because the voltage is just too high, so I eventually titrated the voltage to 3 volts, producing 3.25 amps of current and any more voltage, and I was just seeing continuous oxygen gas bubbles. So it's only been a few minutes, and you can see the blue color forming around the anode. This color comes from the copper ions dissolving into the solution. And here's a brief time lapse to get a better look at how the anode corrodes in the process. And this is where we run into problems with the setup. I haven't touched the power supply, but the current is close to zero, and we still have a bunch of acid and copper left to react. So what happened? Ideally, we could run this reaction until either the sulfuric acid or copper run out. But we live in a practical world, and once the solution reaches saturation, we run into problems. The blue layer on bottom has become locally saturated with copper ions, and copper sulfate has started forming crystals over the electrodes. The layer on top is still clear, meaning there are nearly no copper ions there. If I stir up the solution, the top layer will dissolve the crystals and the electrolysis will continue. Saturation is the point where the solvent has the maximum amount of solute dissolved in the solution. In this case, our solvent was water and the solute is our copper ions. Our experiment ran long enough that there was an excess of solute around the anode and the solvent could no longer keep it in solution, at this temperature anyway. Let's look at this again. Remember that the polar water molecules are attracted to the charged ions and surround them but the solution is saturated around the anode and we're still making more copper ions. Because the copper ions have become so concentrated here, there's not enough water anymore to prevent the copper ions from interacting with the sulfate ions. The result is nucleation and growth of copper sulfate crystals right on the anode. Ionic compounds in their solid phase act as electrical insulators. Because the crystals were growing right on the anode, they insulate the electrode from exchanging electrons, therefore halting the reaction. Keep in mind the whole look of this animation is intended as a simplified explanation. Here's how the molecules really look in their crystal lattice. So stirring dissolved the crystals and temporarily solved the problem. As you can see, the current is bumped up to about one and a half amps. While it's great the reaction can continue again, you might have guessed stirring the solution created another problem altogether. We can see here that the cathode is now surrounded by our blue copper ions. This means that in addition to the reduction of hydrogen ions to make hydrogen gas, we're also going to reduce our copper ions. Even though we're removing copper ions from solution, I think that because we're utilizing more of the solution that was suspended above the saturated layer, we're still increasing our overall yield of copper sulfate. Here's how the cathode looks given more time. Interestingly, this reaction in industry is a way to refine crude copper ore. The crude ore is oxidized and the copper ions migrate over to the cathode and are reduced back as refined copper. So after some time we've developed three distinct layers of solution. The bottom layer is darkest blue and saturated due to the crystallization on the anode again, also indicated by our lack of current. The middle layer is not saturated but is concentrated with solute. And the dilute top layer is formed due to the reduction of our copper ions, as its border delineates right below the cathode. Stirring at this point just risks losing even more copper to the cathode, so I believe we've met the end of this reaction.
As you may have seen, we've definitely accumulated some contamination. My lab is based in my garage, so the environment isn't perfectly clean. An unlucky mosquito or two must have gotten a bit curious, and the rest of the debris is likely unreacted copper metal and possibly some impurities from the alloyed copper tubing. Here's some sped up footage of filtering the solution to separate out the solid contaminants. Some copper sulfate that made it into the solid phase is trapped above the filter, so I'll just dissolve some in hot distilled water and add it to the filtrate. I'm transferring the solution back to the clean beaker, but now that we have our filtered solution, how do we get the copper sulfate out of here? Well, we just saw in the last step. We'll bring the copper sulfate to a solid state and filter away the remaining acid and water. This is where we'll have to remove those water molecules preventing the copper and sulfate ions from forming an ionic compound. By bringing the solution to a boil, the water will leave the beaker as steam, allowing the copper sulfate crystals to form. I'll go ahead and start the heating, and I'll have to add the rest of the filtrate once we boil this down a bit. Here we are partly through the boil, and I'm adding the rest of the filtrate. So we've reduced the volume of water by over half, but we still don't see any copper sulfate crystals. If we started out with a saturated solution and remove half the water, why don't we see any crystals form? The answer is heat. Solubility is a function of volume of solvent and temperature. Graph this relationship when we call it a substance's solubility curve. Since the solution is at an elevated temperature, it's able to hold more solute than when it's at room temperature. Because the solution is super saturated at this high temperature, when we turn off the heat and it starts cooling down, the water will no longer be able to hold the copper sulfate in solution and it will precipitate out in the form of crystals. Also of note, crystals reject impurities as they form, which is extremely convenient as this makes them quite pure by nature. Chemists commonly use recrystallization to purify contaminated solution, like mine likely is here again. And finally, some crystal formation. But in order to get a higher yield, I want to remove as much water as possible, which will require a lot of heat. I'll have to switch to my gas burner as the cheap electric heating element I'm using won't get hot enough. And because the boiling point of sulfuric acid is 337 Celsius, I can get this pretty hot before I stop boiling water out of the solution. Referencing this chart, we'll notice the boiling point will increase as we remove water and the concentration of acid increases accordingly. Hot sulfuric acid is a particularly dangerous beast, so this is nothing that should be messed around with without taking the proper safety precautions. It's for this reason that I'm going to end the boil at 200 Celsius. After 200 Celsius, there's a bit of a diminishing return, and the acid fumes start becoming more of an issue, and it's just a nice round number. <laughs> so unfortunately, my high temperature thermometer broke while I was filming this, but the fumes are starting to kick up quite dramatically, so I think we're pretty close. I'll go ahead and stop the boil here. I'll just have to let the solution cool to room temperature, then cool it further in an ice bath. Vacuum filtering again here. And this already doesn't look exactly how we'd expect though, right? Copper sulfate forms big, beautiful, clear blue crystals. While this is true, this is also copper sulfate. The difference is this looks more like copper sulfate monohydrate. Even though there was some water left in the solution that we filtered off, the sulfuric acid is now much more concentrated, enough so that it pulls the water away from the hydrated copper and sulfate ions due to its intensely hygroscopic nature. In other words, the sulfuric acid wanted the water more and dried out our copper sulfate, leaving us with this pale blue-green color resembling a clumpy powder. To get those blue translucent crystals, we'll need to convert the compound to copper sulfate pentahydrate. When abundant water is available during crystallization, typically five water molecules become incorporated into the lattice structure, four forming coordinate bonds with copper and one hydrogen bonded to the sulfate. I'll eventually convert this to the pentahydrate, but that'll be the last portion of this video. As far as this product goes, after drying as much as possible, our yield came out to 70.09 grams. While this process worked great, I wanted to give it another go. I couldn't help but wonder if I could increase the efficiency still using modifications available to a home chemist like myself. To eliminate cathodic reduction of copper ions, I tried adding a salt bridge to a separate vessel containing more electrolyte as well as the cathode. The salt bridge consists of bent glass tubing filled with our sulfuric acid electrolyte. This way we still get current flow between the two vessels, but the copper ions will have a much harder time getting to the cathode. Secondly, we ran into problems due to crystal growth on the anode. The anode had to sit at the bottom of the beaker where the copper ions are most heavily concentrated. 
A benefit to the salt bridge setup is that I can raise the anode to the top of the beaker. This allows for all the solution within the beaker to become saturated with copper ions without the risk of reducing those ions back to solid copper as a cathode is isolated in a separate vessel. Nothing comes for free though, as a consequence to the electrodes being further apart and the small cross section for conduction within the bridge, I dramatically reduce the current flow. Reduced current flow will result in decreased reaction speed. In an attempt to bolster the current, I added a second salt bridge, which doubled the cross section, allowing for more electrolyte to carry the current. You can see I also increased the power supply's voltage quite a bit. The reaction will still proceed much slower than if the electrodes were closer together, but either way I'm in no particular rush, so no big deal. Having the anode elevated allows us to see this waterfall effect as the ions are produced. These waves are known as Schlieren and are caused by the difference in the refractive index of the two liquids. This is after about 12 hours of electrolysis, and note that we don't see any concentration layering effect in this setup, just our standard homogeneous solution. This is 24 hours in and starting to see a little crystal formation on the anode. 36 hours into the electrolysis and we're starting to get some crystallization at the bottom of the beaker. It's also nice to see that the salt bridge has successfully prevented the copper ions from reaching the cathode as the solution is still clear and I don't see any noticeable plating on the electrode. So about 43 hours in and the current has dropped to nearly zero. While much of the copper sulfate seems to have crystallized at the bottom of the beaker, the anode is totally covered as well now. If we wanted to continue the reaction, we could either add more water to dissolve more solute or create a super saturated solution by heating it up to allow the water to dissolve more crystals in the same volume. Both these options would increase our yield, but I want to compare this yield with that of the first method we tried, so I'm going to end the reaction here. The astute observer would notice that there's a bit of a difference in volume of electrolyte between the beakers in both setups. In this setup, the salt bridge siphoned the beakers to an equal level, and the dimensions of each beaker are different, leading to the beaker on the right to be a little underfilled. I also never corrected an overfilled beaker in our first setup, so needless to say, this won't be the most highly controlled comparison in the world, but we'll see if there's any substantial difference in yield anyway. Here's a better look at the crystal formation on the anode. This makes it a little easier to imagine why we don't get as much electron exchange now. It was regrettable having to destroy such beautiful crystals, but recovering them with hot distilled water revealed the extent of the corrosion to the anode. Vacuum filtering went well, I just needed to add a little more water to dissolve the extra crystals that were recovered from the anode and the bottom of the beaker. And here's our filtrate. Let's get this boiled down. Since my mercury thermometer broke during the last boil, I improvised by sealing some glass tubing in order to protect a thermocouple instead. So I jumped the gun and started the boil over a low flame, but even at the lowest setting, the solution really wanted a bump. So I ended up adding some boiling chips and switched to the electric element for more gentle heating. Even so, I still had a hard time controlling the bumping. For this reason and many, I cannot stress enough the importance of personal protective equipment in the lab. Down to about a thousand milliliters and starting to see some crystallization. Back to the burner with a more constant boil, which ended up being short-lived, but the temperature is reading a little over 120 C. At about 800 milliliters, we're starting to see a lot more precipitant. Okay, down to around 500 milliliters and we've reached 200 Celsius. This was my stopping point, so I'll kill the flame and let this cool down. This is after cooling in an ice bath for a few hours and on to filtering. And here we have another surprise. In the previous boil, because my thermometer broke, I only guessed at the temperature. I must not have reached 200 C because we ended up with the monohydrate, which this is not. It's nice we get to see the difference though, because here we see that with enough heating, once the sulfuric acid is concentrated enough, it will completely dry the copper sulfate into the anhydrous compound. Because the product turned this white gray color, we know that it's void of water. Fun to see the whole spectrum. After drying as much as possible and removing the boiling chips, this yield came to 106.00 grams of mostly anhydrous copper sulfate. That's about a 50% increase compared to the last method. Even considering this isn't a perfect side-by-side -side comparison, I'd say that's not bad considering the modifications were quite simple.
So lastly, I'll need to convert all the copper sulfate into the pentahydrate form. I combine the two products as they're going to be converted to the same substance. And you'll notice that what was the monohydrate has become almost liquid now. My best guess is that some sulfuric acid remained on the crystals, and since it sat for a while, it likely absorbed water from the air. From here, it's pretty simple. We just follow the same steps as before, sans sulfuric acid. We'll rehydrate with distilled water, heat until dissolved, vacuum filter to remove impurities, boil the solution down until we see some crystallization, then allow it to cool. This time we have very little sulfuric acid in solution, so as the crystals grow, they'll have access to water and they'll form the pentahydrate. I'm bringing the solution nearly to a boil to minimize the amount of water required to dissolve the crystals. Using any more water than what's necessary to fully dissolve the crystals in a supersaturated solution will only serve to lengthen the boil. I'll just have to keep it warm through the filtration so it remains in solution. All right, every process from here you're already familiar with, so I hope you enjoy. Our final yield is 120.674 grams. Not huge, but it's all I need. If you're interested, I'll actually be using these crystals in another video to create a medical device, so stay tuned for that. There's still so much more to this process than what I'm capable of explaining, but I hope this covers the basics. Lastly, if you're wondering how to make larger crystals, when you have a saturated solution, instead of boiling out the water, you just let it evaporate. This way, as the crystals grow, they have time to form a more organized lattice structure. I made some using this method and filmed the growth over a two-week time lapse, so I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.